very much. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. I hope you are, too. We're going to have some fun over the next hour or so. I'm going to be presenting material and lecture uh, in a lecture fashion for the first uh, 40, 45 minutes. And then uh, by at least 1 o'clock, and this will go to just before 1.30, I'll open it up to what I call Name That Tune where I'll give you the opportunity to uh, ask me questions and see how quickly I can respond. If you do ask me questions, however, remember, try to make them of a, a, of course, they'll be specific to what's on your mind, but try to be concise in your question and the fact pattern so that other people listening to that question might derive some benefit for it. I'll also ask you at this point in time to turn off, turn off any cell phones that you have or at least put them on vibration mode so that uh, we can continue unfettered. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I hear the sound of the response. I got okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, just to give you a little bit of my background, my name again. Thank you very much. Helen is Morgan Halpern. I was born in New York. My father was a landlord. Uh, he managed 15 tenement buildings in Brooklyn, New York. Tenements were very large, 45, 50 uh, unit buildings where families lived. And my grandfather built those buildings and managed them up to his death. So somehow I was kind of born into the landlord tenant field. Uh, I have been in Nevada County since 1990 and it probably performed over. I hate to say it, but probably at least 400 evictions, and I don't think I've lost any, certainly none that I started. Um, and uh, therefore, I think my father probably rolls over in the grave every time I kick somebody out. I don't think he ever did. Um, I will tell you as a cautionary advisement, I'm going to give you a lot of information today that you think you will be able to use in order to bring or prosecute your own unlawful detainer actions. The actual subject of my next hour's presentation will be basically preparing notes terminate the tenancy, if there's a failure to comply with those notice, how to bring an eviction procedure. And in that same breath, I'm going to tell you, I do not advise you to do anything more than to prepare your notices of termination. If it gets down to the point where you have to bring a complaint for unlawful detainer, it may sound like it's simple. You'll look at these boxes and say, okay, I can save some money. I don't have to hire an attorney. I can figure out how to check these boxes. But you're going to run into any number of problems as you go so down the line. It's not simply the idea of checking a box, filing it, and serving it. Um, number one, if you make a critical error in the complaint, you're not going to get past first base. If the t tenant and this will be mostly geared towards landlords and property managers at this point in this time. And I know we have capable legal counsel who has typically represented uh, in these fashion uh, tenant rights and, and issues. And they will have their time in the future, I'm sure. Um, but if you file that complaint wrong, you can, it's going to be kicked out, possibly. Even if it's not clicked out, the tenant may file an answer. And those answers may have any number of legitimate affirmative defenses or facts, which now you're going to have to figure out how to respond to. Finally, of course, when you do go to court, you're going to have to present your own case. You're going to know how to assemble your documents. You're going to have to be prepared to respond to the affirmative defenses of the tenant. You're going to have to hopefully prevail. And then you're going to have to fill out more forms and ultimately maybe get the sheriff involved to do the physical eviction. Um, and all of these things can be nerve-wracking. You can lie awake at night. You can start to reinvent the wheel. And ultimately, uh, to retain an attorney to assist you, and this is where I get my two minutes worth of my own self-interest plug, uh, if you retain an attorney, you don't leave sleep at night. Hopefully, you have somebody, whether it's me or anybody else in this community, who knows exactly what they're doing. And furthermore, because the landlord and the tenant can often get into emotional conflicts that are difficult to resolve simply because of personality, your ability to communicate during the course of litigation and perhaps come to an agreement called a stipulation, which would resolve the matter without further litigation, becomes somewhat more limited because you don't have necessarily, or the tenant, the skills, communication skills, psychological skills, or the expertise to know what's worth fighting about, what is not worth fighting about, and how to orchestrate perhaps an agreement that would otherwise not require going to court and litigating the matter. So uh, at the end of the seminar, I am going to list uh, I've got some handouts here with some business cards. I only say to those that are interested, if you'd like them, take them. If not, good luck on all those matters. I'm happy to assist you in this general knowledge. Now, let's say another thing. The world of landlord-tenant law is a very complex, uh, very detailed-oriented area. Um, 
if you've done it over and over again, it's like maybe doing it in your sleep. If you haven't, it can be very confounding. Um, the um, ability to evict a tenant is provided for in the law on a very expedited hearing schedule. Normally cases take about a year to get filed and finally get to trial. But because the real property is at issue, the court has a summary or expedited hearing schedule in which you can actually get into court within about 20 or 30 days of filing the complaint if an answer is filed, if, if you don't enter their default. And as such, in exchange for that expedited trial setting and hearing schedule, the exactitude of the details is paramount. The notices are scrutinized, the complaints are scrutinized, and they must be exact, and if there are problems, you go back to step one. And it can be particularly frustrating for a landlord who probably should have won their case to begin with, but because of the failure to cross a T or dot an I, there's a problem. Better? Okay. Very good. Now, let me tell you that there are a number of basis for basically what we're going to discuss is how to terminate a tenancy, a month to month or a lease, and what happens if your desire to terminate that tenancy is not acceded to by the tenant. First of all, before even getting into the service of notices and so forth, let me tell you that there are a number of ways a tenancy can be expired. First of all, let's go back to some basics. All landlords should have a written lease agreement. Okay. Hold on a second. Sir, could I get you to sit down? Any, anywhere you like, but let, let's go for it. Let's let's go for it. But it's starting to interfere with it's starting to interfere with my presentation. Don't want to do that. Whatever. Okay, I don't. Uh, I talk up. How's that? But uh, I don't see any microphone here, so um, uh, maybe you want to sit up closer. There's only so much that I can do. Okay. Um, so to continue, there are a certain number of ways to terminate a tenancy. But as a preliminary matter, first of all, I want to suggest to all landowners or property managers, do not enter into an agreement that is oral. Have a written lease agreement. Have a written agreement. Number one. Uh, that's because that there are a number of conditions in those rental agreements that will be specified, and those agreements are basically promises and obligations that will be have to lived up to by both the landlord and the tenant. And if the tenant fails to live up to those list of obligations, you have different grounds uh, to terminate those tenancies. If you simply have an oral agreement, it, it will typically be very um, simple. You, I'm going to rent you my house. You're going to pay me so much rent, and you may fail to include in your oral understanding a number of essential conditions that you would otherwise want to impose. So first of all, always have a written agreement. Number two, you have to decide, do you want to have a month-to-month -month written agreement or a lease? A lease is simply a specified period of time, typically a year, can be six months, can be longer than a year, but it is a definitive period of time in which you have told your tenant that they have the right to possession of that property. Now, one of the limitations on a year lease or on any lease is that if you decide three months into it that even though the tenant's paying you your rent and hasn't broken any of the rules, there's something strange about this person. You do not want them in your house anymore. You cannot give them a 30-day notice or a 60-day notice and tell them that for no cause we want you to leave. You have promised them a one-year lease and unless they become in breach of that lease, you cannot simply take a 30 or 60 day notice and try to terminate it. That notice is ineffective. So a lease limits your ability to terminate voluntarily without cause the tenancy. Now I've also known many landlords who have had month to month rental relationships and the relationship's been a good one. And that tenant's been in possession for four, five or eight years. And so that there's no, just because a year's lease is up doesn't mean they have, you have to tell your tenant to move. You can continue to accept uh, on a month to month, excuse me, it, just because the month is up, you don't have to tell the tenant to move. You can continue that tenancy for as long as you want. Give periodic notices of rent increase if, if that's of your liking. But um, in any event, a month to month um, will give you more flexibility in no cause termination than a lease provides you. Um, also, 
some landlords say, well, I like the idea of having a lease because then I know that for the next year, my rental house will have income coming in. And I can plan around that. Well, that's a wrong assumption. Because if your, land, if your tenant loses the job six months into the uh, lease, and they abandon in the middle of the night, you will have to take extra steps to try to rent out your place again during the unexpired duration of the lease that was abandoned, and then bring legal action against the tenant to try to collect on the rent, future rent that was not received, that you could not reasonably have received by using reasonable efforts to rent your place out again. So the fact that you've got a year's lease and you think you're going to be guaranteed an income stream for a year is not a correct assumption. Okay. Now, if you do have a lease, let's talk about the basis of terminating tenancies. If you do have a lease that says, all right, on January 1, 2008, you get my place, and on December 31st, 2008, that year's lease is up. You do not, and then let's say come December and you've thought about it and you decided, I do not want them in my property on January in 2009. I don't want them to hang over. The law does not require that you give any other notice, not a 30-day notice, not a 60-day notice. The expiration date that was agreed upon in that lease agreement at the inception of it is the notice to the tenant that your lease ends on that date. Now, if you like the tenant, and on January 1st they tender their rent again, and you say, wonderful, put it in your pocket, you have now created a month-to-month -month tenancy on the identical terms and conditions contained in that lease, including attorney fees clauses and all of that, and you have established a month-to-month -month tenancy, and now that tenancy can be terminated upon notice, 60 days typically, because now the tenant's been there for more than a year, but on the other side of the coin, if in December you decide, no, I don't want that tenant. I've got another tenant I like better. He's willing to pay me more money come January 1. Then pragmatically, although you do not need to serve, remember, there's no legal requirement to serve the notice. And in fact, if you just wanted to be cold-hearted, on January 1, when they're still in your property and they have intended to rent, or even if they have, you said, no, I don't want your rent, you can go down to the court and file an eviction action against them and say to the judge, Your Honor, I didn't have to provide any notice. The lease is up. I don't want them here. But in order to avoid a lot of that hassle, common sense would simply say, as soon as you've made up your mind to a year's lease tenant that you don't want them anymore, call them up, write them a letter, and simply inform them in a polite way that it hasn't worked out and you're not going to renew the lease, and therefore please take steps to remove yourself from the uh, premises by the end of the lease. Now, they may or may not do that, and if you give them enough head time, lead time, they'll think about it, maybe they'll go consult an attorney or legal aid, and they'll find out that you don't have to continue the lease, and maybe you've given them sufficient time to move. But if you wait till the uh, 31st of December and tell them, by the way, tomorrow you're getting out, I'm evicting you, well, it's not going to be easy for anybody. You ultimately will get your property back, but you're going to spend some time and money doing so. Okay, so that's the deal with terminating a lease with a ex fixed expiration time. Now, um, of course, if your tenant unfortunately uh, died in your rental, uh, that month-to-month -month, uh, or, or uh, rental or tenancy agreement will, um, if it's a month-to-month -month agreement and the tenant dies, the, the term will end one month after the last rental payment was due. You don't have to send out any notices. There's nobody to collect that notice. Uh, the uh, tenancy, the month-to-month -month tenancy of a deceased tenant ends one month after the rental, last rent, was due. It doesn't happen very often, fortunately, but, but it can. Sorry, Not at all. Good to see you all. Absolutely it is, right. Um, now, the other thing, of course, you can enter into a surrender of lease agreement with your tenant. Neither of you, you want the other one there. You're all paid up in full, and you just want to be done with each other. You enter into what's called a surrender of lease agreement, in which each side releases the other from any further obligations, or if there are conditions, then you prepare those conditions, and you don't have to go through an eviction procedure. You prepare what's called a surrender of lease agreement, whether it's a month-to-month -month or a lease. It more typically is found in a lease than a month-to-month -month rental. And you can sign a 
voluntarily a voluntary agreement that says, okay, we're separating from this relationship, and, and that will terminate your, your tenancy. Um, uh, and then the final way that I'll discuss this morning, and again, the, the, this area, I mean, this is just one chapter of three volumes, so <laughs> it's going to be uh, a little bit of a scotch, uh, uh, shotgun approach here tonight. Uh, the other way uh, to terminate a tenancy without going through an eviction procedure uh, is if there is a tenant, whether they're on a month-to-month -month or on a lease, and they have not paid you rent due within... 14 days, due on the 1st, and today is now the 15th of the month, and they haven't paid their rent, and you believe that, in fact, they've abandoned that premises, that you look in through the window or in an emergency, you go in through the door, and there's no furniture, there's no food there, uh, your tenant's gone, you don't have to bring a formal eviction procedure to recapture your property. Uh, you send out what is called a notice of belief of abandonment, which says to the tenant, mail to their last known address, You've got rent that's due and unpaid for more than 14 days. Reasonable evidence indicates that you're not living there. I believe you're no longer living there. So I'm sending this letter to you to let you know that in 18 days from the date of this letter, I am going to recapture my property. Unless you respond in writing to me within that 18 days that you have not abandoned the property. You simply went off to Mexico for a month and a half and that you're coming back. And then in that a letter, uh, the notice also says, and please give me an address where I can serve you an unlawful detainer action because now that rent's more than 14 days due and owing, I intend to either collect my rent or, or, or evict you. Okay, uh, we're going to take questions later, so if you have a question, write it down. Okay. Um, so those are some non-eviction procedure methods that a rental relationship can terminate. Okay. Now, however, the standard method for terminating um, a month-to-month -month relationship, you will find you have a packet of things. And one of them is called a 30-day notice to terminate tenancy, and one is called a 60-day notice to terminate tenancy. Okay? These only are applicable, again, on month-to-month -month rental relationships. And if a tenant has been in possession for less than one year, they're only entitled to a 30-day notice. Basically, the essence of a month-to-month -month rental relationship is you, landlord, agreed to give the tenant that property for one month, and they agreed to pay you for one month. That's the essence of that deal, which means, and it sounds cruel, uh, and if a tenant doesn't want to be in this predicament, then maybe a tenant should not sign a month-to-month -month re rental relationship. But the fact is, let's say January 1, you rent to a tenant. And they hire you a haul company, and they move all their stuff in, and they get their utilities in their name. And by about the 15th of, the, of that month of January, you go, those people are nuts. I don't know what possessed me to let them into that place, but I don't want them anymore and they paid their rent for the month. On February 1st, or frankly, at any point during the first 30 days, you can serve them a 30-day notice to terminate their tenancy. And then they will either have to comply with moving once again, or they are subject to eviction. So again, it's a little hard, I mean, it's a little neurotic to rent to somebody and then immediately evict them, so you've got to do your due diligence uh, in terms of making sure that your rental applications, your employment verifications, your income verifications are all correct, and then hopefully you've decided on a person that, you know, you want to have a relationship with. It was like Judge Bryant, formerly retired one of the great lawyers, the judges in Nevada County, used to say, of all, and he would say it in the family law court, and it would be applicable to husbands and wives. Of all the husbands and wives, you two chose each other, and now you want a divorce, you know, 12 days after you married each other. What are you doing? And, but he would also use the analogy for landlord-tenant. Of all the landlords in the world and all the tenants, you two came together. There must have been some reason you wanted to have this relationship. So why terminate it within the first 30 days? But it is feasible. The only thing you bargain for is to provide them that housing for 30 days. So again, if you wish, now we'll look at the uh, notice, if you wish to terminate a tenancy on a 30-day notice, write the name of the tenant in the blank um, and uh, make sure you have the right city and county and the address filled out properly. And this notice is very simple. 
simply says 30 days from the date this is served upon you, your periodic tenancy uh, is up. And if you fail to get out, bad things are going to happen like lawsuits and so forth and so on. My 30-day notices has a lot more verbiage in it just to remind them of all the terrible things that will happen if they don't get out. But this is, this is sufficient. And you date it and you sign it. And notice it says owner or manager, and if somebody reminds me, we'll get back to interesting issues between owners of property and property managers. And, that, and you fill that out, and you sign it, and you make a, a, a copy of it, and you serve it. Now, we'll talk about service in a minute. Now, after you've served it, you then fill out the proof of service on the bottom of the notice. You write the date, the time, the manner, and all of that stuff that's provided for in that proof of service. And then you've got the original notice, a copy of which has been handed to the tenant. And then you filled out the bottom portion of it after the service is completed. And now you have, if you need to, your original 30-day notice to terminate tenancy and your original proof of service. Now, let's uh, talk about service. There are three major ways of serving a tenant. And we'll even consider you have four tenants. Four tenants are in your property. Okay. All of them are named on the lease. You only need to hand the notice personally to one of them. It is presumed that having served one of the tenants, that there is a duty upon that tenant to notify all the other co-tenants that you, we've all got this notice. And whether or not that tenant shares that information with his other three or her uh, uh, roommates or not, you have served the entire group of tenants. Anybody over the under of age, she does not need to be served. Uh, they don't have capacity to enter into contracts. And uh, they come in as the minors of the children, uh, of the parent, and they will be uh, removed if and when necessary. Okay. Now, so there are three ways to do it. Personally handed to them. Now, sometimes landlords are a little squirrely. They, they're angry at the tenants. They don't want to confront the tenant. They owe, the tenant owes them a bunch of money. It's not just a 30-day notice. And even if it is a 30-day notice, they're chagrin at the idea of walking up and handing their tenant a, a, a notice. Okay. That's fine. Uh, then the most, second most typical way is down on the third box. It says, on blank date, I posted the notice in a conspicuous place on the property, typically on the front door with scotch tape or a thumbtack. And then, uh, because nobody else was in the house at the time, I mailed a second copy uh, to the property. So you post it and mail it. Now, here's some tricks with that. Try to get your envelope ready to mail on the same day that you post. Because the 30-day notice starts when service is complete. So. If you post on Monday, but don't mail until Thursday, then your 30 days does not start until the Thursday mailing. So if you get them both on the same day, you obviously don't have any time sequence that you have to be concerned about. It should only be, well, it should at least be mailed regular mail. That's what the statute says. You can supplement it, if you wish, with a certified uh, 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 registered mail certified receipt. Sometimes the tenants won't sign for that, which is why the statute only requires you to do regular mail. And when you do regular mail, you can also get for a dollar what's called a certificate of mailing that will provide proof that you did do the mailing. And if you want to really be over abundance of caution, do it the way the statute recommends with regular mail, and then send it certified mail the same day too. If they sign for it and return, great. Now you've simply got additional proof that they received their 30-day notice. Okay. Uh, of course, you're declaring under penalty of perjury that you've done all these service acts and you then date and sign it. Um, the middle method of substitute service is one that rarely occurs. It can on occasion, and here's how that works. Let's say there are two tenants and they're both working all the time or they're kind of avoiding service and you come to the house and you knock on the door for the first time because you want to hand them the notice, and somebody answers the door. Somebody who says, hi, I'm John, their friend. I've been staying here for a few days. Uh, they're over the age of 18. Um, and you are allowed then to hand John the notice rather than post it on the door. 
and then go to the mailbox and mail the notice to them. And that's called substitute service. Okay, so we have personal service, posting and mailing, or substitute service that's, that, put, uh, that hands it to somebody over the, 18, uh, over the age of 18 who's in that premises at the time you come around, and then you mail it. Again, that's typically not the one that's used because sometimes if the tenant's not home, there's nobody else home, and sometimes you answer the door, uh, you knock on the door, and all of a sudden there are eight people in your residence and you don't know who they are and why they're there, and that probably is a breach of some other conditions of your rental agreement. But anyway, that's the issue of 30-day and 60-day notices. Now, the uh, legislature, in its wisdom, or not, had determined that although the 30-day notice period had been on the books since 1848, it decided when a billionaire, Japanese billionaire, bought an entire subdivision down in Rancho Murrieta, too close to the state capital, in which he immediately took, I think, 300 single-family home rentals and gave 30-day notices to every one of them because he wanted everybody out and he was going to do what he was going to do with his property. Well, he was able to do that, but the legislature got so much uh, flack on it, uh, they changed the law, they changed it back a few times, but as it is currently exists, if a um, tenant has been in possession for more than one year in that dwelling unit, they're entitled to a 60-day notice. Okay? Uh, the, there's some wrinkles in the law. For example, let's say you are an apartment complex property manager or own, owner of an apartment complex, and that tenant was in unit number one for six months, and then because of some reason or other, you bring them into unit number four. Well, then they have not been in that dwelling unit for more than one year, even though they've been in your property. So in that case, they're only entitled to a 30-day notice. You understand the distinction. Okay. And finally, there is still a, requi a, a possibility in the law that even if you have a tenant who's been in there for three or four years, you can terminate their tenancy on a 30-day notice if you have listed your property for sale, it has, it, you've got a sale agreement, you're in escrow, uh, you've got an escrow number, then that tenant, because you want to sell your property uh, hopefully without the tenant still residing on it and you want your closing to occur before, uh, while the tenant, after the tenant has left, there is a provision and a special uh, notice that typically the realtors have that allow you to terminate a long-term tenant uh, who's on a month-to-month -month on a 30-day uh, notice. And another thing I should remind you, if you are selling your property and you do have a, a, a tenant who's there for, with a lease for two years and you want to sell your property, that tenant goes along with the sale of your property unless the new owner or you can cut a deal with that tenant to get them to vacate before their, their lease is up. Otherwise, and that's maybe another downside of a lease, it limits you if you want to sell your property and, you, and the new buyer insists that it's vacant. Okay. So those are the methods of terminating without cause. Now, the ability to terminate for cause, the number one reason, and unfortunately just because this country at the moment is in dire economic problems, we see foreclosures going on all the time. We know times are tough. People are losing their jobs. Uh, and by the way, the dog ate my homework. Um, you typically find that the number one cause to evict a tenant, whether on a lease or month to month, is due to the failure to pay the rent. And we're going to take a very simple situation. Rent is due on the first. Okay? A late charge kicks in on the fifth. You do not have so. Number one, this is confusion. Just because you have a provision that says rent is due on the first, but the late charge doesn't kick in till the fifth, you do not have to wait to the fifth in order to serve your three-day notice to pay rent or quit. Rent is due on the first. On the second day of the month, you can serve your three-day notice to pay rent or quit. And that gives them three days, and we'll look at the notice, to pay that rent or quit. Now, if you are a property manager and your landlord has given you instructions that you don't want to start eviction procedures that aggressively that quickly, so that you've been informed, all right, we're going to wait to the sixth before we hand out notices. Well, in that case, there's been two breaches of the lease. There's the breach of the lease because the rent was not paid on the first, and now the late charge provision that kicks in on the fifth day has now been, is now operative. So on the sixth day, you can serve both a three-day notice to pay rent or quit and a three-day notice to perform covenant 
or quit for the late charge, and now you've got two bullets in your eviction gun, not just one, and even if they paid the rent in full within the three days but failed to pay the late charge within the three-day period, you can go and proceed to evict them because they failed to pay the late charge. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more. You'll, um, let's talk about the three-day notice to begin with, though. All right. Again, the three-day notice to pay rent to quit, that's the boilerplate that you see here is you write to the tenant's name, the property address, um, and again, I don't like this form particularly. Uh, please take note that you owe rent in the amount of blank. Well, I, um, are we looking at this form? Okay. So it says, please take notice in the first paragraph that the rent on the premises occupied by you in the amount of blank dollars from the time period from blank to blank is now due and payable. Um, that's okay. It'll pass muster. Uh, if it's only one month, then you write from December 1st to December 31st, the rent's not paid, $800 is due. But let's say you've been lax, and I've had, it's unbelievable to me, I've had landlords that have allowed tenants to go for rent unpaid for more than a year. I, I wanted a landlord like that. Um, but in any event, uh, my form spells out each month. You know, August 1 to August 31st, $800. Uh, September 1st to September 30th, $800. So I subtotal it and then give the grand total at the end. Maybe I just like to be a little more compulsive in my detail than this form. But in any event, let me make sure you understand. The rent must be exact. If you overstate the amount of rent in your notice, if you include one more month than they owe, which they don't, if you include late charges or interest or bounce check charges or utility charges, you invalidate your notice. You don't get to first base. You get thrown out. So make sure that your accounting is correct and you include only the exact amount of rent. Now, if you've got to make an error, underrepresent it. If you're not sure whether they perform that $100 worth of labor that you said you'd give them a discount on their rent for, then assume that they did do the rent and discount it because you will pass muster if you underestimate your rent, but you'll get thrown out of court if you overestimate it. Okay. Then, once again, um, you serve that notice, and unlike these that have a nice little line that indicate the top half is what you give to the tenant, the bottom half is what you keep and fill out, uh, this three-day pay quit notice doesn't have that little line. Um, Oh, okay, excuse me, excuse me, uh, I'm misreading this. Okay, sorry, sorry, my fault. Um, in addition to filling out the top, of course, the law has become very specific that you instruct your tenant exactly how to pay the rent. We're not going to play hide the ball with getting the rent to the landlord. And there are typical methods. Number one, if you want the rent to be given to you personally, check the box, write your name, write your address, write your telephone number, and put down the days and hours that you'll be available. Mostly I write 24-7 on the dates and times that I'm going to be available. You want to come to my house at 1 in the morning and pay me my rent within the three days? Come on over. I want your rent. Okay? Or if your address is a physical address like 112 Elm Street that they can get to, and unfortunate for the tenants, if you're an out-of-town out of landlord and you're down in Salinas or Cormel and you have an address and you've entered into a rental relationship and you want the tenant to pay the rent to you within three days and you put down your Carmel address, it is the obligation of that tenant to get the rent to you within that three-day period. If they got to drive it, if they got to do FedEx, if they got to get a messenger service, they must get the rent to you at that address which is physically capable of receiving it. Um, now, if on the other hand, you don't want the tenant to know where you live and you use a P.O. box for the collection of your rent and the tenant mails it to that P.O. box and can prove that they deposited in the P.O. box uh, in, the, in the post office to that P.O. box within the three days, even if it takes up to six days to get to you, they have complied with the three day notice, which is why I do not suggest P.O. boxes, because then you, if you're uncertain whether they paid the money or not, you can't start your unlawful detainer until the seventh day because they had six days to get the money to you. 
So if you, if you, if you started it on the fourth day, and then on the fifth day, the, the, the P.O. box gets delivered your check, and you see the postmark is within the three-day period, you wasted your money filing that unlawful detainer action. You, if the tenant tenders the full amount of rent within the three-day period, you must accept it. You must accept it. Even if you don't like them anymore, you must accept it. If they attempt to give to you anything less than the full amount of rent, you do not have to accept it. You can reject it. You can send it back to them. If they attempt to tender you the full amount of rent after the three-day period has expired, you don't have to accept it. They lost their chance. Now's your opportunity to get rid of them. Uh, if they have tendered the full amount to rent to you in, after the three-day notice has expired, you have two things. Number one, well, you have three things. Don't do the first one. Don't cash it and put it in the bank. You've waived your notice. Either make a copy of the check, write them a letter, send them back the check saying, I am not accepting it, it came too late. Make a copy of your letter, keep it for the court file if necessary. Or tell them that I'm not accepting your rent, I'm holding on to your check only as evidence to present to the court uh, that you have failed to move out. And then use it and keep it as evidentiary purposes. My preference is to Xerox the checks and send it back to them. And I know it's hard for landlords who owe a lot of money to then take money and send it back to the tenant. But that's the best way to preserve your ability to go forward and evict them. You will get a judgment against them for the money they owe you. Hopefully you have enough security deposit to deal with some of those issues. In other words, pay yourself back for the money they owe you. Okay. And finally, uh, one of the nice ways, um, and uh, this says by electronic, oh, to the account at the following financial institution. Now, some landlords say, gee, I don't want them to know my bank account number. And you write bank account, bank account, um, uh, account number such and such, located at uh, Main Street, uh, Nevada City. Now, the tenant can't go into your account and pull out your money. The only thing they can do is put a deposit into it. So don't be shy about giving them your bank account number because you don't have to wait on the post office. Uh, and then you know right away, did they deposit it or not? So those, personally, by mail, watch out for the P.O. box or to the financial institution. Um, electronic transfer, if previously established, I'll have to research that. Um, I'm not sure whether that's like a PayPal type of thing or not, but I'll have to catch up on my internet uh, concepts. But uh, it's generally not used. Okay, and once again, in the bottom of the notice, it tells all the bad things that's going to happen to them in the event they don't comply. And I want you to look particularly at the bottom language. Further, if you fail to timely pay the amount demanded by this notice, the undersides declare the forfeiture, the forfeiture of the rental lease agreement. That means that not only am I declaring you in breach, but I am also declaring you, I am terminating your contractual right to possession. So we're over. If you don't have that language in there, and you go to an eviction action, and you prevail, and the court says, yes, they didn't uh, pay you your rent, so they owe you the rent, but you forgot to put in your notice that you declared a forfeiture, the tenant can ask the court uh, to relieve them of the forfeiture of their lease and right of possession, and they'll be re reinstated back into the lease agreement because the landlord failed in their notice to declare a forfeiture of the lease at the same time that they informed them that they were in breach. Okay. That's as much as I want to say about the three-day notice to pay a rent or quit. Uh, let's talk about the three-day notice to perform covenant or quit, and then we'll talk, and the proof is... Now, again, you will have, by the way, again, for each one of these forms, the same proof of service. Same thing we discussed about the 30- and 60-day notices. You simply have to fill it out, check the boxes, sign it, etc., in the same manner as we talked about the 30- or the 60-day notices. Okay. Now, this one, the three-day notice to perform covenant to quit is an underused form for attempting to uh, terminate a rental agreement, lease or month to month, that has been breached by the tenant. But the breach is not the number one breach, the failure to pay rent. 
The breach is you had a no pet policy and now they got six Hiberian Huskies living in your house. Uh, the breach is that you told Jane and John Adams that they could live there and now there's 12 other people in that premises that you don't know who they are and they weren't authorized occupant. The, the breach was that they'd said that they were going to pay the rent on the 1st but it showed up on the 18th and so that they're late with the rental charges. The breach is that they promised to pay their utilities or reimburse you for the utilities you paid on their behalf within five days of notice and they forgot or failed to pay you the utilities after you gave them that notice and on and on which are all all these paragraphs in your lease agreement are covenants biblical term from the old days which I think at that time required cutting parts of bodies nobody's asking you to cut any parts of bodies but the word covenant has now simply become to known as a promise and in your, your lease agreements, it's simply a paragraph in the agreement that says, I agree to do this. And so this three-day notice performed covenant can be very powerful if you have a variety of material violations going on in your rental property that are not uh, permitted under the lease. Now, you got to know how to fill this thing out all right. So again, you write the tenant's name and the address. And then it says, you're notified that you are in violation of the lease or rental agreement under which you hold these premises because you have violated the covenant too. In there, cite to the paragraph, paragraph 6.A, late charges. Failed to pay rent within five days means a $90 day late charge. And then, so you cite the language of the rental agreement in the first blank lines. And in the following manner, you write, you got 12 dogs there. You didn't pay the rent within by the uh, fifth of the month. You failed to pay the utilities. So you kind of, just in layman's term, explain what did you not do. So the first part, you cite to the lease. You kind of quote down the language of the lease succinctly in pertinent part. Don't fill out the entire lease there, just, just a little paragraph. And then what act did they fail to do? Then you sign it and date it and once again Make a copy, hand it to the tenant, fill out your proof of service, keep the original for your records. Okay. Now, there is some situations in which the breach by the tenant is so significant, so material, that it's not curable. What we've talked about, we've got no cause terminations. Those are one type of things. We got the three days to pay rent or quit, three days to perform covenant or quit. Those are in the alternative, do this or that, and um, they're curable. They're curable breaches. That's why they have alternatives. But if I rent my property to Mr. John and I say no assigning or subletting permitted or no assigning or subletting permitted without my consent, and John decides that he's going to rent out half the uh, rental property to Mary, then he has violated such a material term of that that there's no cure. It's a non-curable breach. Both he and Mary get a three-day notice to quit. And they can't cure it. They must either move out or they will be evicted by the uh, judge because they have violated the prohibition against subletting or assignment with or without the landlord's consent. Another material, if the tenant starts destroying your property so bad that the um, house is losing value, that a, such that a real estate appraiser or a realtor could say, well, before you put that tenant in, it was worth $200,000, but my God, they took out every interior wall, they took out the roof, they took, it's only worth $150,000, or, or, you know, a substantial amount of money has been destroyed. They have committed waste. And that is one of the grounds of three-day notice to quit. Also, if they decide to turn your house into a crank factory, that is a violation. And it's just, it's just, yes, even in this liberal community, that is a violation of the lease and a three-day notice to quit. Uh, I want to just take a brief comment on the medical marijuana laws because I get so many calls about that. Landlords call me up. They're growing pot downstairs. Um, what can I do? Well, if they're on a month-to-month, -month, you can give them a 30-day notice or a 60-day notice and terminate their tenancy, and hopefully they won't find it in the middle of their harvest season. On the other hand, um, you uh, can not terminate them on a lease 
simply because they're growing medical marijuana if they're paying the rent and doing everything else on time. The law has determined that people have a right, if they follow the guidelines, to do medical marijuana. I have been assured that as long as you are not conspiring with your tenants to grow marijuana and sell it for profit, the DA is not going to bother the landlord about this. And hopefully now that President Obama is in here, the federal government's not going to bother us because they don't recognize California law in this regard. Uh, but, again, if you're on a month-to-month, and you find out they're growing pot, even if they're allowed to do it, you can ask them to give them a 30 or 60 day notice and there you go. Um, so as far as the three day notice to quit, it's illegal, uh, um, illegal activity, waste to the property, or a violation of the assignment or no sublet clause. Those are the principal three non-curable breaches. Okay. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a second. And we are going to try to get through some of this complaint for eviction. And this is where I say to you, if you've served your notices and you've never done an eviction and now they give you this package and say, okay, start filling out this stuff, this is where I say to you, think about whether you want to go forward in pro per. I also believe that if you are a um, corporation um, or a trustee, that is like you put your property in a trust and now you're the trustee of the trust, I do not believe, and I will check it, but I am not sure you can self-represent yourself as a corporate entity or even if you're the president or uh, the trustee of a trust without having legal counsel. I will double check on that and I apologize for that because some of you have it, are in that predicament. Clearly, if you're a solo, if you're an individual who owns a piece of property and you're the owner of it, you can represent yourself in eviction action. There's no problem like that. If you're the holder of a power of attorney, on behalf of somebody, you can initiate an eviction action. If you are a property manager who has a signed, written property management agreement with the owner, uh, you can initiate an unlawful detainer action on behalf of your owner. I've cautioned some of my property managers, however, it is better to have the plaintiff be your client, the owner of the property, because ultimately the judgment should accrue to them, that is they're owed the money, not the property management company. And I will also caution property managers that when you fill out the lease, and I've seen this often, don't put Century 21 Property Management Company as landlord. Put the name of the owner as the landlord, and on your standard California, California Association of Realty forms, on the signature box, there will be a place where it shows you are the agent for the owner filling out this lease on behalf of them. But I would not call the property management company the landlord on page one, line one of the lease agreement. I think that's a mistake. Um, it complicates things. Also, remember, you must have a written property management agreement uh, if you are going to fill out notices and serve them or if you are going to bring legal action on behalf of your clients. Okay? It must be in writing, the property management agreement. And again, the California Association of Realtors has an excellent two, three page property management agreement. Okay, let me stop here now. I will open it up briefly for about 10 minutes worth of questions on notices and service and proof of service. And then I'll try to get through this complaint for eviction within a few minutes of time. So can I have any questions, sir? Yes, exactly right. The uh, form that says three-day notice to perform covenant or quit is the operative notice that gets served after the fifth day, filled out saying, well, you haven't paid me my rent, so you're probably giving them a three-day pay or quit at the same time, and then you're giving them the second notice that says three-day perform covenant or quit, you now owe $90 to $50 in late charge. Must serve both notice. Do not put the late charge on the rental notice. And one last covenant before I get to the next question, which is... I have seen landlords fill out late charge provisions that are onerous, ridiculous, and non-enforceable. Like, after the first, if it's not paid, you owe me 50, if it's late after the first, you owe me $100, and another $20 every day till the end of the month. So by the time you calculate it, the late charge is, is more than the rent. The courts aren't going to enforce it, folks. A late charge is a reasonable approximation of the administrative hassle and trouble that is required for you to prepare a three-day notice to perform covenant or quit or the other notices and serve them. It is a reasonable approximation of that. I would suggest as a guideline not even 10% of the rent. 
somewhere. He says six percent, or he didn't. He wouldn't go over six. Well, again, six percent is certainly safe. I would say up to ten percent. It starts to get dicey. Eight percent, I got no problem with. But if you get beyond 10%, I think you're going to have trouble. There's no rule on the book uh, in the business and profession code. Uh, the mortgages, residential mortgage lenders are only allowed to charge us 6% on the amount of the monthly rent, uh, on the amount of the monthly mortgage due. It's capped at 6%. And so that's kind of a guideline. And I see Supreme Court cases come down, California court cases come down that says with late charges where the balloon payment isn't made, we will not allow a 10% late charge on that balloon payment. Uh, it, it's onerous. It's really a fine, not a, uh, a penalty. Uh, so anyway, 6 to 8% I think is, a, is, is about reasonable. Question? Yeah, I was wondering, as a property manager, can I do the service too, or is that That's what, no. Property managers, great question, and I, I missed it. Owners of the property and property managers can serve their own three-day notices to quit or 30 or 60. You can serve it yourself. You don't hire. You cannot serve the, the person who's lit, the plaintiff in a lawsuit cannot serve the summons and complaint, but they can serve their own pre-termination notices. And can it say three days on a lease for it to be late fee, or you said five, that is, I have three. You can have three, yeah, that, that's negotiable. Uh, the, if, in fact, the standard um, CAR form uh, defaults to five, but there's a box you can check and there's a blank and it says other. You could put two, three, one, five, seven, doesn't matter. That's up to you in the negotiation. Yes? Are the guidelines that you're outlining here, are they the same for residential and commercial? Or are they going to change for commercial? Um, this is specific to, uh, to residential. Once you get into the commercial, it gets a little more complicated. Some of these rules apply. Certainly the service process typically apply. But commercials are a, uh, a heightened uh, degree, uh, you can provide three-day notice of estimated rent to pay or quit, and in that case, the amount doesn't have to be exact. You can sometimes include in commercial notices other than rent if those other things like late charges utilities are defined as additional rent. Uh, if the commercial notice provides a, a service of the notice shall be in a place other than the premises, you may have to contractually comply with that service. So there are wrinkles with regard to that and, and again it would not, you know, this lecture is not intended to discuss uh, mobile, home for, uh, mobile home evictions. They're subject to whole separate things. Evictions of borders or lodges that rent single rooms. Uh, this is really for the meat and potatoes type residential uh, apartment complex and, and single family home eviction process. Um, so if you're in a place and you have a year lease with a landlord, mm -hmm. and I being the tenant, can they put the house on the market within that year lease? Absolutely. Okay. But then the buyer would have to take it subject to that lease. Right. That's correct. And then they're right. Thanks. Yes, sir. To further put a lockbox or to gain entry to the house, they would have to have the tenant's permission. Now, the, and, and, and this is a little, okay, th that's a good question. We'll follow up on this. Uh, the tenants have a right of privacy. You have rented them your apartment they, uh, or, or house. They have the exclusive right of possession there. They have a right of privacy, right of quiet enjoyment. However, that doesn't completely deprive the owner of the property of the ability to go in and, and, and do things that further their interest. Uh, and, and I'll just quickly say that a landlord has a right to, upon 24 hours' notice, to gain entry to their residential property on during normal business hours. Now let's first stop at that, business hours. I don't, I might take the position that business hours are Monday through Friday. Saturdays and Sundays are family days. Somebody's Sabbath, Saturday, somebody's temp, uh, church day, Sunday. So the fact is, I would take the position, and realtors unfortunately don't like this because when do realtors show property? They show property on the weekend. Um, and so you can get a conflict or maybe you can get a cooperative relationship with the tenant to do so. But clearly you have the right to go in Monday through Friday upon 24 hours written notice. Now, the, if your property is listed for sale and, the, land, and the, the property agent has served upon the tenant a CAF form which is good for 120 days, which says this property is listed for sale, I am giving you written notice that we uh, want to come in on occasion. Uh, then in those listing situations, the realtor only has to telephone them within a reasonable period before. 24 hours is deemed reasonable. Shortened periods are sometimes deemed reasonable as well. And then they are allowed to go in and show that property. Otherwise, if you haven't served that 120-day notice uh, that covers it for that four-month period, uh, then realtors are supposed to post that notice on the door 
24 hours in advance of when they want to go in and show that property each time. So clearly it's advantageous to use the uh, catch-all notice that gives you another three or four months of just telephony notice. Otherwise, you mu and now let's go into the reasons. You don't go in just because you want to be a looky-loo and see how they're cleaning your house up. Okay? You are allowed to go in an emergency. What's an emergency? Well, one, you think they're not there anymore. Two, the house is on fire. Three, there's water flowing out of the, onto the driveway. Um, uh, somebody's screaming for help. I mean, <laughs> those are emergencies. Otherwise, you're only allowed to go into that premises to um, uh, provide agreed upon or necessary repairs to show it to actual or potential purchasers uh, lenders or uh, tenants, um, and there may be a couple other things under Civil Code Section 1954, but uh, uh, they don't come to mind at the moment. But that's typically the major reasons. Now it can, and I'm not really going into this because it's a little bit outside. Now that you can get to the door, you serve your notice, you told the tenant you're coming in. It's it's Monday at three o'clock in the afternoon. And, they, and if they're not there, of course, you have a key, your lockbox, you go in. But they're there and they go, no, I'm not going to let you in. Well, my suggestion is, number one, make sure you have a copy of your notice. Number two, call the sheriff. The sheriff will typically come over and uh, talk to the tenant and say, look, you're in violation of the law if you don't let them in. I'll stand here. I'll make sure they don't steal your stuff if that's what you're worried about. And typically, you will smooth the situation over that way. I will say, if the sheriff doesn't help you and you don't, uh, are not permitted entry, you can come to this court on an ex-party application or some kind of petition, and the court will order that tenant to allow you to go into the premises. I don't know, maybe Robert does, whether the court will sanction the tenant for the, uh, or what the court costs uh, filing for that petition or ex-party application are, or what the sanctions might be. I don't know how often it is, but I know on a couple of occasions I did not use that, and because I didn't use it later on, it came back to bite me when uh, we wanted to prove that the tenant was not cooperating in our repairs of things they later said were habitability issues. And because we hadn't come to a, got a court order so we could go in there and repair, the court took the position that we hadn't done our due diligence and it didn't go well. Yeah. Uh, question. Yes, sir. Um, I believe I was illegally uh, evicted after one month. Uh, in, on September 13th, I received simultaneously uh, a 30-day three, a notice to quit and a 30-day and a notice to quit on the same day uh, for no substantial reason. And well, the 30-day notice requires... Not signed by, and it's signed by another renter, not, an, not the owner or his ostensible property agent. And Sounds like I you've... voluntarily uh, didn't want to live there anymore, and I got out as quickly as I could. Uh, about 10 days. And your question is? How should I... He won't refund my $400. Okay, well, that's not the subject of this. Take him to small claims court. Okay, again, spoke to, talk to the people in public law center, they'll tell you, but that's a security deposit issue, and, and there are, go bring a small claims action, there's, talk to the public law center about that. Okay. Now, the question? Uh, yes, you give somebody a 30-day notice to leave, yeah. and they go, fine, I'll be out in 10 days. Right. Use my, use my security deposit. Yeah, that's a typical ruse, unfortunate, yeah, and there's not much you can do about it. Okay. No, no, good, but ask me, I'm oh. Well, here, here, no, see, that's the problem. Let's say you really believe they're going to get out, but they didn't pay you your rent. So you could start an eviction process, but by the time you even get near anywhere near beginning it or completing it, they're already out. Now it's not an eviction action because they're not in possession, and you don't have this expedited right unless they are in position. So basically, make sure you get enough security deposit, but they do owe you for the full month's rent. You don't have to prorate. If you give them a 30-day notice and they say, fine, I'm out in 10 days, you still have the right to collect your 30 days' worth of rent. Are these guidelines that you're outlining also, uh, do they apply to handicapped persons or do they have additional, uh, additional uh, Well, the handicapped people have in, in a variety of additional rights under landlord-tenant law, but with respect to the payment of rent and eviction procedures, they have no special uh, accommodations with respect to that as far as I know. Okay, uh, take a moment more questions and I will try to get to this complaint if you want. So, how, how can you use your deposit uh, yes. to, to apply for rent ahead of Okay, good. So, uh, le, le, uh, again, this wasn't intended to be a security deposit thing, but we're happy to dance along. So, uh, <laughs> your, your tenants left. 
Uh, it's right down this code section if any of you are going to be junior lawyers here. Section, Civil Code Section 1950.5, Subdivision F or G. Uh, and again, I'm really not going to go into the details of security deposit because that's a whole other course. But you're required within 21 days of the tenant vacating to send to them an itemization of their security deposit and the charges against it. If they owed you rent, let's say you gave them a 30 day notice, they didn't pay the last month's rent, and they left, you can take that 30 days rent off of their security deposit, in addition to any other damages beyond ordinary wear and tear, cleaning to restore it to the same level of cleanliness it was at the inception of the lease, uh, any other unpaid charges due under the lease. You must s send to them with that letter corroborating documentation the invoices, the bills, the repair estimates, the, the accounting, so that they see that you're just not making these numbers up, you actually got repairs or invoices or estimates. Now, if they disagree with your accounting, they can go to small claims court, like I suggested to that gentleman, and contest it. So that was within 10 days? Within 21 days of their vacating. 21 days. Yeah. And, um, it only has to be sent to their last known address, which is typically your place. You hope they put a forwarding address, but if they did specifically tell you where they're moving to, then you must send it to that place. So <coughs> it's applied to, say, you've got $50, but you're, you're sending them back on, you know, $1,000. Do you need to send that $1,000 back to them in their security deposit within 21 days? Oh, yeah. A any unused un a portion of that security must be refunded within 21 days. Within 21 days. Yeah, right. Yes. Well, your one quick with your, uh, we dealt with you and we're very happy. Thank you. Um, like to hear that. Could you say that louder? Louder. Oh, yeah, he was great. We did get a judgment to the court. Right. Uh, and the people that ended up owing us months worth of rent, cleaning messes, methamphetamine, crap, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Lying about having children. I mean, just everything you talked about. Right. Well, what is our stand now? I mean, we've never seen the person again. We've not gotten any from her. Okay. Small claims court. Two things. Small One. All right. Two things. One, just because you got a judgment, which is a piece of paper, and I'm not going to go into enforcing judgment too much, but I'm happy to briefly answer the question. Just because you got a piece of paper with a judgment doesn't mean it's self-enforcing. And that reminds me, when you do get a judgment, if, if you're successful in evicting the tenant, Pay for the writ of possession and pay the sheriff to post the notice because otherwise you could wait forever until that tenant decides to move out and you are not allowed to use self-help self, self help techniques in California. That is, we don't throw the suitcase out with, and the baby in the bathwater like they do in Louisiana. You, even if you got a judgment for eviction, you can't harass them. So pay the $140 total, get the sheriff to put the notice on the door, and in five more days, Mr. Mike's coming back and they're going to be removed. Now, with respect to your judgment, if you can find the tenants, you can get an order from the court to make them come in for a debtor's examination and tell you all about their bank accounts, jobs, so forth and so on, which would lead to levy on the bank accounts, garnishment of the wages, seizure of non-exempt personal property. But the second part of your question is, if they've also caused damage well beyond the amount of your security deposit and still owe you a bunch of money, the limit in small claims court is 7500 bucks. And so you can go to small claims court and put on your case for the additional damages they cause to your property. Also, if you have a lease and they've really done some damage to your property and the lease has a, or a rental agreement with an attorney fees clause, you can hire me and we'll go after them for property damage and then the judgment would also include your uh, attorney fees, reasonable attorney fees. John? Yeah, I have a question about growing medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that violates the mold agenda, but if the owner of the property, I mean the property manager, yeah. um, can't the owner say, no, I'm invoking the federal law and allow them not to grow marijuana on their property? because the federal law is more restrictive, that's the governing law? Yeah, well, I, w I wouldn't take that because I think the state of California and states' rights is much more important than the federal uh, DEA's position. But, uh, no, I, I, this is such a strange area. There's no case law on it. I don't think your position is going to be supportable. Certainly, I'm not sure that the, the state attorney general doesn't agree with that position. Uh, and, and so uh, I think if they're growing it outdoors, that's one thing. And I'm not even sure about this mold thing. I mean, if they have proper... Uh, 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 air conditioning and all that other stuff, whatever they're doing, and there's no mold growing, then I don't think you got a mold problem either. So I don't know, John. It's it's a tough nut. Um, so can you stipulate before the, the lease 
use is consummated, can you, can you uh, stipulate that time that there's no marijuana? Growing? I think that that's a possibility. And, and, and here's the rub, because, you know, if you said to a cancer patient, you can come rent to my place, but you can't take any interferon, would the law uphold that provision? I don't think so. And if, these can and if these people are cancer patients, but medical marijuana helps alleviate their suffering and it stimulates their appetite, and you put in the lease, I don't care, you can't grow any marijuana in my property, will public policy determine that that's a violation? There's a possibility. There's no case law on it. Of course, you could argue, well, you don't have to grow it then. Why don't you just go to the dispensaries and buy it? Uh, and then, you know, could you put a no smoking inside the house policy? Yeah, I think you could do that too. Uh, I certainly think that that would be a legitimate request because obviously otherwise you're going to go to the sheriff and say they're growing pot and they're going to show the script to somebody or else they're in violation. Better they show it to you than to the sheriff or not show it to you and not to the sheriff. Yeah. Okay, if you want me to go on to the complaint for eviction, I'm going to have to stop the questions now and just kind of briefly touch that. Yeah? Okay. And again, I, I, you've been advised. So, um, civil case cover sheet. Uh, we'll get summons. Okay, let's just start with the complaint, and we'll get to that other stuff later. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, I'm going to say if people have to drift out, I do have some business cards here, and I do have what is my two-page uh, circular on, on my eviction procedures, costs, and so forth, if you're at all interested. Thank you all for attending. Who is attending? Uh, okay, apparently... Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, 115. Some people have to leave. If you're leaving, thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure, folks. And uh, uh, Listen, would you rather me just answer questions for the next 15 minutes, or would you like to hear about the complaint? Can I get a show of hands? Who wants more questions and answers? All right, who wants to hear about the complaints? Thank you. We're going on to complaints. Okay. All right, we're going to go through it fairly quickly. If you are leaving, then... Okay. Page one of the complaint at the very top, if you list your name, your address, your, your telephone number, and uh, the second series of box lists the street address, the mailing address, and the branch name of the, uh, um, of the courthouse here in Nevada. And the plaintiff and defendant should be obvious. The, the, the tenants and, uh, are the defendants, and the plaintiff is the landlord or property agent. Uh, you check the box called complaint. It's not an amended complaint. You check the box that the action is typically a limited civil because the amount in dispute typically does not exceed 10000 if your rent is only, you know, 1500 bucks. You check that box. Now, that's the caption, okay? Now comes the allegations, the essential allegations. These are the minimum number of allegations necessary to perfect your complaint. Number one, plaintiff, John Doe. You are the owner. Alleges against defendant, John Tennant. Number two, plaintiff is usually an individual over the age of 18, sometimes a corporation or other, like holder of power of attorney. So you have to figure out your status. If you are a owner who has uh, filed a DBA, a fictitious business name, and you're operating buildings like Glenbrook Apartments, you write down, and you filed your DBA, your fictitious business name statement here in the county, you say that you've complied with the fictitious business name laws, and you specify it under 2B. 3A, you write your street address, apartment number, city, zip code, and county. Number four, your interest is typically as owner, but it could be other. Other would be a power of attorney holder, um, Maybe you're the tenants evicting your subtenant. So it depends upon what your relationship is. Um, number six tells about the basic essence of the rental relationship. On January 1, 2008, defendant John Tennant agreed to rent the premises on either a month to month or, or a one year lease. Check your box, agreed to pay rent in the amount of blank. On a monthly, typically, basis, rent was due typically on the first or other day specified. Box number 6B says this written or oral, check it, one or the other, was made with plaintiff, or if you're a property manager, maybe it was made with plaintiff's agent, or maybe it's a lease that you inherited and it was your predecessor in interest, the person who sold it to you. 
and you check that box. If you fail to check some of these boxes correctly and the tenant goes to a, a, a lawyer or a legal aid, some of these mistakes will be fatal and you will be finding that you're now involved with a motion to demur or motion to quash. Again, you have to know what you're doing and you have to read about what you're doing, not just come to a 15-minute lecture on how to fill out a complaint. Okay. Second page. Typically, 6C, the defendants not named in item 6A are, well, they could be subtenants or assinees, but three typically is other, and I typically write unknown occupants or minor children. That's where the minor children show up. Um, if the agreement was changed, for example, if the rent was originally $1,000, but somewhere along the line it went up to $1,200, you, you specify that the rent was changed here. So when your three-day notice says rent's $1,200 and the lease says $1,000, you've explained that the rent was raised subject to notice. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, then uh, include a copy of the written agreement. I can't tell you, some landlords, property managers, they, they, they lose their rental agreements. Don't lose your rental agreements. It's like losing your will. <laughs> you went to a lot of trouble to fill these things out. Put them in a safe place. Don't put them in the storage box. Move 12 times and not remember where they are now. Okay. Um, of course, if you can't find it, then you see under 6F, a copy is not attached because it's not in the possession of the landlord or it's simply solely for the non-payment of rent. I've never checked that box because I want that rental agreement. If I have an attorney fees clause in that rental agreement, I want to produce it to the court so they see it, even if I'm evicting somebody just for the non-payment of rent. Now, defendant in box seven, defendant, you write the names of the tenants, and what kind of notice were they served? A three-day, a 30, a six-day, th or other. And you check the appropriate box. Now, on 7B, it says on blank date, the period stated in the notice expired at the end of the day. I can't tell you how many times I see this wrong. Is there a calendar anywhere here? Yeah. We haven't even, oh, I guess I should have discussed how you count days. Oops. Oh well. All right. So let's say here's November 14th. All right. You serve your notice on the 14th. You don't count the date of service. You count one, two, three, Monday the 17th. When you look in box number seven, uh, eight, uh, uh, seven B, on blank date, the period stated in the notice expired. That's the 17th. That's the third and final date of the notice when it expired. Okay? I often see the same date you served it put in that thing. That would cause your complaint to fail if an attorney took it to task. Um, let me also, since I, unfortunately some of the people have, have gone, but let me talk about the three day, the, any of the three day notices, the covenants or the quit. If I served my notice on the 12th, and remember, we don't count the first day at the date of service. One, two, three, the 15th. But the 15th is a Saturday, which is a legal holiday. So that's not the third and final day. It gets continued to the 16th. But the 16th is a legal holiday. It's Sunday. It doesn't count. So the three-day notice that you served on the 12th actually doesn't expire until the 17th. It, 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 it automatically, right, by operation of law, uh, it will default. So if you're a tenant and you got served a notice on the 12th and you handed the check to the landlord on the 17th, he cannot refuse it saying that it was up on the 15th. He'd be wrong, and if he tried to evict you, he'd lose his case. So the 17th would still be the third and final date, and that's the date that would go in that um, box. If the 17th is a holiday, like Mondays often are, good question, it continues to the next business day, the very first non-holiday uh, non date. Now, um, okay, so now 
Um, you check the box. The notice included an election of forfeiture because we discussed it and you know why. Uh, you check the box that says a notice is attached and labeled Exhibit 2. And um, 7F means that you serve different notices on different tenants on different dates, and you have to explain all that. I've never used that because my evictions don't get into that. Now, box eight all talks about how you served it. Remember the proof of service that uh, we have here? Well, that it mirrors the language in box eight. The notice in 7A, the three-day pair quit, was personally served or subserved, or number three, posting and mailing. And you fill out and check the appropriate boxes. And now you've told the court that you served it on this date, you know when the expiration date was, how, the, how it was served, and you've given them the essential information with regard to your service. Um, you'll see that uh, actually on the 30 and 60 day notices you can serve a fourth additional way by sending it by certified mail. Not the preferred method, because again, if they don't sign for the certified mail, you know, you, you can't, it's hard to prove, and you'd still probably be able to prevail, but I just like posting and mailing or personal service. But 30 or 60 day notice can be served by certified mail. Then, um, if you did personally serve under 8B, let's say there were two tenants, and you gave that notice to Mary, then you wrote, Mary Tenant was served on behalf of Mary and John Tenant. Uh, now, you include that proof of service as exhibit number three to your complaint. That is a proof of service that we filled out that's either on the bottom of your three-day pay or quit notices or the separate proof of service um, for uh, the other type of notices. And that's funny. Oh, I see why. Okay. Uh, they combine the on the three because you don't have to have uh, all the electronic payment and the uh, it didn't take more time. Okay, um, and now we turn to page three. If you're evicting somebody, not because you served them any of those notices, which means that boxes seven and eight basically wouldn't apply, but because it was the expiration of a fixed term lease which means you didn't have to serve any notices, remember that discussion, then you check box number nine, you demand possession because of the expiration of the fixed term lease. But more typically, you're going to be checking box number 10, which says at the time the three-day notice to pay rent to quit, the amount of rent due was blank, and you put in that amount. Can you, can you put into that, 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 included that whole month, like, it's like November, it's like as a payment month from, for, for November, so I would serve her now, but it's for this month. That's right. In other words, your three-day notice would be for the whole month of November, and you'd be putting in that amount of rent. Okay, all the way up from August or whatever to, the, to November, even though... Yeah, if she owes you rent from August to November, and you gave a three-day notice for that rental period, yeah, you then you put that entire amount there. Oh, yes, not just the one month's rent, but the entire rent, rent due. Now, also on box number 11, the fair market rental of the property is so many dollars today, Take your monthly, take your rent, a thousand dollars a month. No, make it easy. Nine, nine hundred dollars a month. You got thirty days in the month. Thirty dollars a day. There's different ways of calculating it, but that's simple. You could also take your monthly rent if it's one thousand four hundred fifty-five dollars. Multiply it times twelve, which is a year. Divided by three hundred sixty days in the year, you come up with the same figure. You could divide it by three hundred sixty-five days if you want to really fudge it. Anyway, it gets a little confusing there. But you want to figure out what the daily rental value is for each day. Because if you don't evict them within the period of time that the rent is due, let's say you don't evict them by no, uh, November 29th and November 30th, or November, 30, November 30th, and it, now your hearing is in December, you're going to be entitled to so many dollars for each day for December 1, 2, and 3, and that's where that figure would be used. Box 12 talks about uh, malicious damages and... and, and uh, Fines up to $600. I've never seen it awarded in this court. You can try. You're wasting your time. Um, 13, a written agreement between the parties provides for attorney fees. If you have such an agreement, check that box. 
We have no local rent control. If there's any other allegations, you check uh, box 15, get a separate judicial counsel form blank sheet, and write whatever essential allegations in it. I use that when I'm representing property management companies who have served those notices or who are the plaintiffs so that it can explain to the court that there's a written property management agreement that the property manages on behalf of the owner who is so-and-so. So I explain that in my separate attachment. Naturally, if you're a single-family owner with a single-family rental, you don't get into those attachments typically. And then 17, this is what you want the court to do for you. You want possession. You want your filing fees, your service of process fees. You want your past due rent, if that's what it is. You want reasonable attorney fees, if it's in your agreement. You want forfeiture of the agreement. You want damages at the rate um, stated in item 10 from, like in your example, uh, the three-day pay or quit notice was through November. So you want the daily damages from December 1st onward. And H, other, uh, is basically a standard phrase for such other and further relief as this court deems proper. And if, for example, you have also served a three-day notice to perform covenant or quit, which wants $100 in late charge, under the other, you can write late charges, 100 bucks. That's what that other box would be used for. Now, uh, if an, an a UD assistant helped you, write that they did and get that information. There's a lot of people going to paralegals that don't, that get, first of all, they're practicing law without a license. Secondly, they don't, they're not susceptible necessarily to uh, malpractice. And third, they don't like filling this stuff out to tell the court that they're doing this. But the court and the state legislature want you to have them fill it out if you're going to a paralegal who's helping you do this stuff. Uh, but if they didn't, check the box, they didn't, and then you date it, type your name, and sign it. And you must also verify it on the bottom. So you not only sign it up here, but then under penalty of perjury, you tell the court that this is a verified complaint, that all the facts are true, to the best of your knowledge, and you date and sign it. So you're actually signing and dating it twice on the bottom of page three. Now actually it's 1.30. I will take about two more, three more questions, and then I know Ms. Helen's going to say it's time to go. I apologize, there's just so much in this area of law. Question. Do you hire an attorney to yeah. get someone out? Right. Uh, yeah, if, if you're declaring the rental income, yeah. Yes. And of course, you should be declaring the rental income. So it is a tax deduction. Okay. Second question? Uh, credit checks. Yeah. Where, where? How do you do them? Where do you get them? Uh, where to get them? Good question. I am not an expert in credit checks because I am not a landlord, so I don't typically pull them. But uh, I think the collection agencies might know. John, maybe. Uh, this gentleman afterwards, if you talk to him, he might be able to help you on that issue. And you can only charge your people no more than $35 uh, to pull a credit application and background verification stuff. Next question. One last Where one. Uh, section 798 of the Civil Code, the Re Mobile Home Residential Law. And it's a very complicated area of the law. Of course, the law library has tremendous number of not just the statutes, but treatises that give you step-by-step -step discussions of all mobile home residency law. That's correct. And it applies to people who simply rent the mobile home, too. Helen, thank you very much. Thank you so much. As always, it's a pleasure. Thank you, folks. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. And my friend Harold George, thank you, Harold.